kok suaranya nggak keluar putra? Put, nggak keluar suaranya. Recording in progress. Okay, good morning, uh, CBC. Here's Ajin from NPO Indonesia. Can you hear me clearly? Good morning, CBC. Here's Ajin and Devi from NPO Indonesia. Can you hear us clearly? Good morning, Morana. Good morning, Borana. Here is Adian and Dewi from NPO Indonesia. Can you hear us clearly? Hello. Do you hear my voice? I am Forena. Yes, Forena. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Okay, Restore we can here. hear you. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu peserta webinar kami dari Direktorat Bina Produktivitas perkenalkan nama saya Jen Kurniawan, di samping saya ada rekan kami Ibu Dewi. Nanti kita akan mulai pukul 9.30 waktu Indonesia bagian Barat dan di dalam chat room mohon izin Bapak Ibu kami akan share link untuk absensi yang kami harapkan dapat diisi oleh Bapak Ibu sekalian sebagai daftar hadir Bapak Ibu telah mengikuti acara webinar pada hari ini. Kemudian nanti yang kedua akan ada materi yang disampaikan oleh narasumber dan akan kami sampaikan linknya pada sebelum akhir acara agar dapat menjadi referensi Bapak Ibu sekalian dalam mendownload materi yang akan disampaikan pada hari ini. Demikian informasi yang dapat kami sampaikan Bapak Ibu. Terima kasih atas kehadiran dan Bapak Ibu yang sudah standby di dalam Meeting room pada pagi hari ini kita akan mulai pukul 9.30 tepat sampai dengan kurang lebih pukul 11.30 waktu Indonesia bagian. Oh,
Hello. Party, Thank you.
十分钟了。去检查一下。频道二，英文，英文，英文
Kami jalanan di depan kantor Pak Buat Perpustakaan pada hari Senin telah sirikum. Jadikan sore Anda lebih berkualitas dengan rangkaian kejadian penting yang sedang hangat diperbincangkan. Jangan lewatkan. Money <laughs> 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 <laughs>
。那等到等到那个、啊、我等到我生完，你要跟他讲啊，叫让孩子睡觉睡觉。隔壁有两间。开始玻璃玻璃了。在在在，因为怕五人群聚。哈哈哈。Good morning, Morana. Are you listening? Is that clear? What do you want to do, Maria? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Morana. We we ready to start? Okay. Hello. Good morning. How? Are we clear there? Our voice. Okay. Okay. The voice is okay. Dia nggak buka itu, coba buka punya. Punya dia kita ngeliat gambar mana ya? Iya. Coba. Mana mereka? Alosi. Apa itu? Oh, yang Alosi 01. Yang Asus siapa? Asus dari peserta kita. Alosi 02 mereka juga. Iya. Jadi. Tuh nggak ada suaranya. Orana, coba telefon dulu apa? Teks lagi. Oh dia nanya ini lagi nyambung. Hello, hello, hi hi. 我们可以开始了吗？呃、uh, ，Can we begin? Good morning, Morana. Can you hear us? Is it alright for us to begin? Yeah, I think、uh, we have. Distinguished okay, friends from Indonesia, my colleagues from Taiwan, welcome to the Asian Productivity Organization Center of Excellence Hospital Manufacturing's、uh, online seminar with between uh, Taiwan ROC and Indonesia. And through this seminar, we hope to further deepen our relations and work further in terms of smart manufacturing.、Uh, allow me to introduce our representatives first. The first would be the managing director of China Productivity Center, Dr. Guo Ming Wang. To his left, we have the deputy general manager of CPC, Mr. Jian Fei Zhang. Next, we have、uh, Director Liu, so from CPC. Our representative from the industry is Director Bing Fang Lu from the Taiwan Shenfang Technical Research Corporation Company, and Manager Yi Zhang Cai, who is in charge of the training courses at the China Productivity Center, would now like to. Welcome, so Dr. Gus Mahadi, Director of Productivity Development, Director General of Vocation Training and Productivity Development, Ministry of Manpower, to join us. It's also a pleasure to welcome P.T. Bandangan Territor Agun's Director, Mr. Janda Suyanto.、Uh, we are not. Able to tell who is who from the screen here, but I trust that you're already online. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear my voice? I hear 
Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Right then, without further ado, uh, we'll begin with the opening remarks. Allow me to invite Dr. Gomi Wang to give his, an opening remark. Uh, Dr. Wang, please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Director of Productivity Development, Director General of Vocational Training and Productivity Development, Dr. Gasmadi, Mr. Janda Sugianto from PT Banagan Tertagun. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's truly a pleasure to chair this online seminar on smart manufacturing between ROC and Indonesia on behalf of the Center of Excellence on Smart Manufacturing under APO. I also like to give my thanks to Indonesia MPO for assisting the organization of this seminar. Hereby, I offer my most sincere gratitude during the 61st governing body meeting held at Manila in 2019, it was decreed that the Center of Excellence on Smart Manufacturing will be established in the Republic of China. And ever since its establishment, the center has sent delegations to Vietnam and Thailand to share our experience in smart manufacturing. We've also visited companies in person to provide diagnosis services and assist the promotion of smart manufacturing in Vietnam and Thailand. The pandemic that broke out last year did not allow us to visit our friends in APO in person, but we still met online and were able to meet with friends in Indonesia and Malaysia to share our best practices in smart manufacturing as well as Industry 4.0. The purpose of the center has always been to provide a comprehensive smart manufacturing solution for all our member countries and to promote productivity. The ROC government has been rolling out the five plus two smart manufacturing policies in the past years. And this has successfully assisted our industry upgrades. We understand that for Indonesia, the manufacturing industry has also become a top priority in the recent years. And you have the Indonesia 4.0 program, which will help Indonesia strengthen its strategic roles under a digital era and improve the overall productivity of all industries. Before in our seminar today, we would like to share the execution and structures of lean smart manufacturing, the establishment and setup of a smart food factory, as well as training courses for related talents that we have been providing to our community. We hope the experience we share will be of use to you. And we also look forward to hearing from your experience in terms of smart manufacturing. Once again, I wish the event a success and prosperity and health to all of you. Thank you very much. Now let's welcome Dr. Kasmahadi, Director of Productivity Development and uh, Director General of the Vocational Training and Productivity Development Ministry of uh, Manpower to give us an opening remark. Thank you so much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Uh, Dr. Wang, uh, Manager Director of China for the Living Center. Good morning, Mr. Respectative from China for the Living Center. Good morning, all. And Mr. Spencer, and participants, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to deliver all 
Red Peter to put in the army of free. The open is blessing. We may rather refer in the opening session of the smart unaffected webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, in the context of COVID-19, business, job, creativity, and manpower have serious impact. All the public sector organization have given the cities new challenge and opportunities generated by the pandemic. It also shifted the work of work which we know previously in order or option better as division. There is the policy innovation and cooperation scenario that can help the other this condition. Testing in the work of work becomes our needs to understand too in regards with situation and manpower, innovation, my creative step of the art with perfect small point of view, especially in the manufacturing sector. This may come in several policies, innovative. And other things, we ask a new business process. The purpose are all main power, are all the, the creative added value to in the society strategy as the interest of supply and demand price selling. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar will serve all the center of excellence for small, smart manufacturing corporate the service and the block reality to cooperate among the member countries. Thus understanding the importance of smart manufacturing for the future. It will also provide as point of view it will be essential to maintain productivity and competitiveness very in the pandemic era. This will what also like the extent or gratitude to the China Productivity Center and expert and participant MPU in Indonesia and also other parties we have support and make this program run slowly. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time with me like Rahman Rahim. The smart manufacturing webinar is officially open. Thank you very much. Good morning. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank Dr. Gasma. Thank you, Dr. Gasma. Now we are going to proceed with uh, the first presentation on the agenda. First, let me invite Mr. Jian Fei Zhang, Deputy General of CBC, to give us a presentation on uh, lean uh, smart manufacturing implementation method and structure. Uh, Managing Director Wang of CPC and also Dr. Gus Mahadi. Good morning. I'm going to talk about uh, LSM, which is Lean Smart Manufacturing, and also how we can introduce the element of intelligence in Lean Smart Manufacturing. First of all, I'd like to talk about the origin of uh, Lean Smart Manufacturing, or as LSM. In February last year, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Seng Xiong Xi 
reminded us that after the COVID-19 pandemic, and we need to we needed to develop smart manufacturing in a more uh, proactive manner. As a result, uh, President Bao Chen Zhang of CPC instructed that based on CPC's uh, over 20 year experience in lean manufacturing, as well as uh, smart technology, we should uh, engage in further integration. And then we have come up with LSM. What is uh, lean smart manufacturing? In the past year, I've seen a lot of uh, literature or papers uh, talking about management being used as uh, the basis or the foundation, particularly lean management. And then we can further integrate it with uh, smart manufacturing. But how can we do that? And what does it look like uh, when the integration is done? But we could not find any uh, literature. So two years ago or last year, um, probably in the beginning of uh, last year, in in the beginning of February, I was very proactive in looking for an answer and I have worked with closely with my colleague to develop this structure. And in the course of the development, we try to gain an understanding of the current situation of uh, enterprises. They on the surface don't feel that, it, it, they don't appear to have any problems. However, their uh, yield could not be uh, improved. Their productivity cannot be further enhanced. And how can they uh, progress from automation to smart uh, manufacturing? How and also how can they link different legacy manufacturing systems? And also how can they link link manufacturing systems with uh, IT systems? I think these are all key issues facing uh, companies. So that's where uh, we come in. So uh, in the pursuit of LSM, uh, we have identified six core concepts based on green productivity and with uh, lean management as the method. And then we should uh, try to make good use of uh, the, the new era of smart technology so as to improve the development process of uh, Industry 4.0. I'm not going to go into details about the six major tools. I'm going to uh, introduce them later in uh, subsequent slides. Uh, if we explore the driving force of uh, smart manufacturing, there are three major driving forces. The, the first is a flexible manufacturing, quick response to the market. And then we can then it includes uh, demand value and also waste minimization. The second tool is automation system. The uh, equipment should have the ability to reflect upon itself. That is, it should be capable of uh, making its own adjustment. And the third tool is that the manufacturing system should achieve zero failure, zero hidden danger, and zero accident and zero pollution. These are the three major conditions for the development of LSM. And in November last year, I uh, represented uh, the CPC in announcing the structure. So the structure was developed jointly by um, the team of uh, the CPC, and also we published a paper about this in December last year. LSM has six uh, objectives. If you look at, uh, well, I'll start with my I'll start my introduction by first looking at the dotted box here. First of all we want to talk about the use of smart sensing and then through IoT, we can achieve smart automation. And it's more like a Toyota style TPS or automation. It's not automated uh, production. It, it means that uh, it, it refers to automation with involving human intelligence. 
in the past, when we talk about uh, quality control, we had to uh, gather uh, data online before we take conduct measuring and calculation. But whatever the case, there will there would always be time lags. So we hope that after uh, on-site data are collected uh, through the sensors, and then if any abnormality is found as a result of the measurement, uh, uh, warnings will be issued, and uh, the results will be uh, notified to relevant people to resolve the issues. So in the past, we obtained on-site uh, data and uh, there were time lags as a result. Um, there were a lot of uh, defective products and uh, our uh, losses were significant. Let me, let me talk about uh, monitoring using uh, parameters. If you look at uh, the, the, the left por portion of the slide, it depicts what happened in the past, we use uh, people to feel the equipment and uh, to measure and get data with uh, equipment and tools. Uh, oftentimes, when the operator was not careful, uh, there will be a lot of defective products. Particularly, this kind of scenario was quite common in chemical plants and food uh, factories. If you look at the right, and we, we, you can see a scenario where information is integrated with uh, sensors uh, deployed. And we conduct automated remote monitoring. And I think today you are more interested in the tracing operation of food factories. So, so I think in the future, a lot of uh, parameters can be recorded and traced. In the left, uh, in the, when we talk about Toyota style lean management, the people are the ones who conduct measurement on the production line. And when there was any abnormality, the different uh, lights will be turned on. And uh, when there is any irregularity, different uh, colors of lights will be used to demonstrate or to, to indicate the problems. And in the future, we'll be using Bluetooth connections to automatically show whether it's a faulty product or an approved product. For example, the Bluetooth caliper here, the results measured from this digitally connected device would then be immediately shown on the dashboard. If any abnormalities is found, the system will also automatically notify the related personnel through a mobile app. It is also possible for us to allow the system to make that communication through the line app as well. So if we move further regarding the monitoring system, when a, an equipment is about to break down, we usually would be able to detect increased vibrations or increased noise. Therefore, if we can set up a sensor next to the machine to detect early signs of abnormal vibration or noise, then it is possible for us to detect the its possibility of breaking down earlier. This can serve as an early warning and will prov prove to be invaluable for the quality monitoring as well as enable just-in-time production. As with the Toyota style management, automation actually is able to make up for any anomalies and faults in the production line as it's able to automatically notify the manager of such cases. So 
Another example we'd like to share is real-time reporting and the visualization of said results. Just-in-time is a well-known concept and they use signboards or kanban in Japan, in, Jap in Japanese. And basically the kanban is a card or a signboard and it's a way for on-site workers to have an immediate understanding of the current resources at hand. But this is of course uh, handwritten or it's written material. And it's possible that the signboards that you move along with the inventory, there's also a possibility of a time lag. For example, if the personnel do not update the information at short intervals, then the information shown could have a time lag. Therefore, if we look to the future, it's best to integrate such information into a digital system that's able to show the resources on site directly on the dashboard at the war room. It is also possible to show this screen on mobile phones or mobile devices, for example. The picture on the left would be the traditional Kanban just-in-time method of manufacturing. You can see these signboards listed as set up in the warehouse. As I've mentioned, the Kanban basically means a signboard. It's actually a card made from acrylic and it shows the current progress in the manufacturing line, for example, the raw material needed, as well as the current steps. For Toyota, this is what they define as a storefront management. That is, they show the information on site, on signboards, so that it's easier for workers to understand what's going on. But if we look into a digital era, we can definitely display such information on mobile devices, such as cell phones or monitors, the tablets, like the picture on the right. Other than a digital dashboard, speaking of a lean smart management, we also talk about eliminating waste. And there are basically seven types of waste that we want to eliminate. For the Kanban system, they use a different colored lights, fixed volumes, fixed quantities, and standardized uh, measurements in order to speed up the production. They have tricolor lamps to show the current status of the production line and event bulletin boards to communicate the latest developments. This is used in the traditional Kanban system and workers will determine its current progress, uh, whether there's an abnormal issue regarding quality based on the lights, the tricolor lamps. But in the future, we can combine all this information into a monitoring system that shows the information on a dashboard. For example, you can see that the manager or the a general manager, even a CEO, would be able to actually see this information in real time on his or her preferred device of choice. Next, I would like to talk about networking in the factory and on the shop floor. What many countries and Taiwan are talking about nowadays is 
digital, dig, digitalization and the digital transformation. So what exactly is digitization? If the results are shown by a meter, then that's actually analog. Digital means transforming the information into digital signals and to connect the production line with our MES and ERP system so that we can have remote control over the production sites. In the past, such communication cannot be carried out through reports, either in paper or orally, but in the future, we hope to carry out such communication digitally. If we look at this slide, as mentioned in the past, the workers relied on the tricolor lamps to determine what's going on at the production line and its current status. But in the future, with these sensors in place, and for example, a SCADA system, we can input all the on-site or shop floor information directly into the MES so that the information is readily available. This slide shows the digital structure that we have in mind for the future. It's a connection between the SCADA and the MES and ERP system. So with this connection, the information can be further uploaded into the ERP. And the manager will then have a better grasp of the current production volume, production quantity, etc. My next topic would be on a digital war room. If you look at this slide, you would see that when we managed production lines in the past, we might rely on such LED displays or whiteboards like those shown on the lower part of this slide to understand what's going on at the shop floor. This could include information related to the current production quality, how many production lines are working, and the status of each production line. But in the future, the information, since they're already digitized, can be linked to our financial system and the cost management system so that the managers will be able to manage cost in real time. If we look at this production line, you'd see that humans are actually working closely with computers and the manager is able to manage and get the latest feedback in real time, be it the current production, the quality level or cost. Next, I'd like to talk about innovations in the value chain. I think we have been focusing on productivity and we're moving into industry 4.0, but the key concern has always been how to commercialize the entire process to make sure that it increases productivity. That is, for these manufacturers, they need a way to sell their products to customers. In the past, this could be done through retailers or through wholesalers. But in the future, we believe it's the customer that would make their request directly to the manufacturer. And this will actually involve three factors. That is the people factor, the factory factor, and the manufacturer. So for such business in the future, manufacturers will actually be uh, collecting the data of the customer's preferences directly 
and work with the customer to develop uh, the products they want. If we use a, a girl's clothing manufacturer as an example, which is also a company that we assisted in the past, uh, the manufacturer of the company would actually solicit information from the girl's mother because the mother actually knows best and the mother that buys the clothes for the girls. So uh, what they need would actually be, the, for example, the patterns, the textile material, etc. And people may have different preferences. Some would prefer to have uh, different types of sleeves, some prefer lighter colors, some prefer darker colors, and different customers actually have different preferences. So in the past, this could only be carried out through surveys, but now uh, this can actually be done quicker with the assistance of digital devices. And it'll be easier for customers to detail the exact design they want on their clothing. And with that information, the manufacturer can then um, produce customized clothing for that specific customer. So if we look at the uh, actual transaction scenario, you would see that the online community and, for example, um, online e-sailors or online retailers can also be involved. This is different from Industry 3.0 because in the past, we treated the online retailer simply as another channel, but now we're talking about only channel layout as the manufacturer itself is actually also able to contact the customers. So I think the biggest difference between industry 3.0 and 4.0 is the business model. So for CPC in conclusion, what we do nowadays is we use the iBench to provide an industry 4.0 uh, analysis first. And then we assist companies to build up an understanding of Industry 4.0, to build up knowledge first, to understand what needs to be done. And then we help them digitize the information that they already have so that they can access them digitally. We also work with them in regarding talent training and provide a further training courses. Of course, we understand that because of the pandemic, um, our friends from Indonesia are, una are unable to visit us in person. But for the location, for the site I'm currently at, that is our Taichung, CPC Taichung site, we have actually set up a, a dojo exper experimental site to showcase what smart manufacturing would look like at this training center. This would include, for example, the visualization of information, the integration of robotics, as well as how dashboards can be set up. We also have classrooms here that focus on IoT and, for example, the human machine interface, PLC, et cetera. And also PLC, MM machine interface, and also a smart sense, uh, sensing and IoT classroom. It collects uh, information and then it integrates uh, uh, coefficients from uh, uh, remote communication. And also there's a classroom that deals with uh, uh, different motors. And also we have a classroom that deals with big data. And also there is a classroom that deals with uh, electric power distribution. And then the sixth classroom, uh, deals with different projects with uh, real uh, equipment and machines. And the students can learn how to do the programming and do systems integration. So after the pandemic is over, I'd like to uh, welcome our friends from Indonesia to visit us 
and uh, ex uh, share your experience with us. However, uh, as a result of pandemic, there were several uh, members, member countries uh, that have uh, planned to send people to engage in long-term learning. However, uh, their uh, plans uh, have been uh, affected by uh, the pandemic. Even for this exchange, uh, uh, physical visit is replaced by a webinar like today's. I'll stop here. Uh, I'd like to, uh, again, uh, welcome our friends from in uh, Indonesia to visit Taiwan in the future if they have opportunities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zhenbei Zhang, for your sharing so that we can have a better understanding of uh, lean smart manufacturing. So if, uh, if you have any questions regarding the presentation, you're welcome to uh, uh, submit your questions through our uh, chat room or platform and then we'll address the questions later. Now I'd like to invite the second uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Binbang uh, Lu, Director of the Taiwan Shenfang Technical Research Company Limited. Good morning. My topic today is uh, the full smart uh, factory uh, experience in setting up and process design. I will talk about the need to overall com com uh, to comply with the overall uh, laws and regulations in the uh, setup process. I cannot switch to the next slide. Okay. This is the outline containing four, these uh, four major items, primarily there are requirements, legal requirements and requirements for the buildings of uh, food factories. And also there are requirements uh, for the different operations involving people and also the handling of materials. And also we have to consider uh, the need to comply with what is describing uh, a, um, paragraph A and paragraph B. So uh, in paragraph A of the outline, usually regarding the establishment process for a food factory, in addition to the hardware, the plant and the interior uh, layout, we, the environment and the space should also meet our food and safety and construction safety uh, laws and regulations. The pipeline should be, uh, um, set up uh, closer as close to the seating as possible and also the pipeline should be concentrated to facilitate management and also we should try to prevent a safety issue if, because of any accumulation of water on the floor for different countries they have uh, their own requirements for food factories under their own food uh, safety and, and sanitation requirements, their factories should be set up pursuant to these requirements. Regarding factory registration, first of all, you need to have a building for which you have owned the building uh, use license so that you can conduct further planning in the course of uh, production for a, a food factory. We have common standards all food factories have to meet these common standards. In addition to these common requirements or standards, the national laws and reg reg regulations require that there are some professional and de dedicated food factories that are subject to additional requirements for food factories. So for these professional food factories, uh, your lab, your equipment and operation are also required to be compliant so that you can uh, be qualified as uh, professional food uh, factories. So in addition to the original requirements for food factories, for uh, professional food factories, they are subject to uh, more re requirements from beginning with uh, the buildings the hardware space, the wall, 
the pillars, the interior and the, uh, the outside portion of the building. And also only uh, light colors can be used and so that uh, it's quite visible whether the cleanup has been properly conducted. And also the material should be uh, non-absorbable, impermeable and easy to wash. And also the floor has to be uh, uh, acid and alkali resistant and also wear resistant. And also uh, the draining uh, capability of the uh, floor is very important there should not be any accumulation of water on the floor. So in the process of uh, building a factory, a special attention is paid to uh, the layout of the floor regarding the draining capability of the floor. And also regarding the ceilings and also the overall in, uh, environment, th these are also very important. There should not be any uh, peeling off uh, of uh, dust or, or, or paint from the wall, or, or there should not be problems of mildews. So we need to uh, try to avoid any of the so-called blind spots from our observation. So regarding the lighting, the requirement is primarily about the, uh, work, the workstations and the processing stations, the lighting requirement is over 200 uh, candelas. And for the uh, machinery equipment service, the lighting should be over 100 candelas. Assuming that the uh, operation uh, space is uh, self-contained, there should be uh, ventilation so that we can control uh, the fallout of dust. And also in the environment, we should set up uh, uh, vector uh, control uh, facilities. We can use uh, the kind of uh, uh, design as shown in, on the slide and the gutter should be, uh, uh, should be able to be, dissess, uh, to be taken apart for cleanup and for maintenance. And also we should try uh, to uh, prevent the incursion of uh, different uh, pathogens. So we want to avoid pathogens through the proper design of the hardware. And also regarding the toilets, uh, we need to uh, pay attention to the control of water. And also regarding the operation in such room, there should be a buffer area to control the airflow. And also the door of the toilet should not be facing the uh, operating environment directly. And uh, we should have uh, uh, hand washing uh, standard procedure. And for, it's preferable that each factory should have, uh, should uh, take the actual uh, pictures of the environment and then they can use uh, the uh, pictures to educate and communicate with the uh, employees. Now, regarding the warehouses, the requirement is that the height of uh, the floor should be higher than the ground outside. Otherwise, there may be accumulation of water on the floor. And also regarding the pallets, we need to use uh, um, items that require that, that meet our requirement regarding the changing room, there should be uh, isolated uh, locker rooms for the employees. And there should be men and women's changing rooms that should be separated. And also regarding this, uh, the sanitation, the facility should be close to the operation area. And uh, we can use uh, devices that can control uh, the rodents. So for this kind of uh, operation, we need to have proper, uh, co uh, proper coding system and proper recording system that should be integrated for uh, ease of uh, control. Now, regarding the, uh, the area planning of food factory, we need to optimize the production process. It is preferable that our production should be arranged 
in a way that is from the inside to the outside, that is from A to B, C to B to A to D or B to C. So for this kind of uh, arrangement, we need to avoid or control cross contamination. Now regarding the control of different areas, we need to first categorize the areas. We want, in order to prevent uh, cross contamination for the uh, cleaning area, but we will set up different areas. That is a cleaning area, quasi cleaning area, and the white area is non food operated areas. So we will consider the cleaning area and the cleaning um, steps. And then we have uh, also the heating and the preparation step. And then through, and then there is a buffer room for the exit. So you can see, uh, we begin with uh, the hand washing and this uh, disinfection room and also the changing room. This is a schematic that if you, if you can look at the red arrow that is about the cleaning and the blue arrow indicates uh, the, uh, the direction of uh, material handling. So after people enter the area, after the packaging is completed, we can, there, there is only uh, one direction that can go. You can, should not reverse the direction. And then it is based on this concept that we uh, plan our automated uh, production. The raw material and the semi-finished products and finished products, we try to, uh, we, we put them together, or string them together uh, in the hope that through the uh, standardization, we can enhance our production volume and also reduce the, uh, the manpower that is required. Let me give an example. We have an automatic uh, rice cooker. In this uh, piece of equipment, from the input of uh, rice, and the rice will start, uh, was uh, the cleaning of the rice or washing of the rice will begin. And one person can uh, handle the entire uh, uh, continuous production equipment. Assuming that we want to produce one ton of rice, all I need to do is to uh, control the computer and uh, uh, call for a, a particular quantity of rice with a particular weight. And then the cleaning will be, the washing will be conducted automatically. And then there'll also be a water filtering stage that actually uh, removes the excess water. It's only at this stage that uh, human intervention is required, but all the rest will be automatically done. The washed rice would then fall down into the box below and the box can then be heated or cooked. Of course, uh, gas would also be needed during this process as a certain level of heat is needed to make sure that the cooked rice is, um, is, is, is edible, it's is good to eat, and it's basically tasty. So uh, a certain level of control of the firepower is needed. Here we can see a diagram of the entire process. As you can see, rice goes into the um, washing system first. After it's washed, then it's transported to the container where it's soaked, water is drained, and then the washed rice falls into the containers that goes into the machine that we call the rice friend, which boils and then steams the rice, and then it's allowed to simmer. Uh, this basically determines on the type of rice that you use. The, it about takes about 20 to 25 minutes during the boiling stage and about 30 minutes during the simmering stage. Of course, as I've said, this determines, this is determined by the type of rice that's being cooked. And for a 15 kilogram pot, 
it would depend on the type of setup you have. It could be a 20 pod setup, 40 pod setup, or a 60 pod setup. If you've run the system for seven hours, let's say uh, one hour cleaning and the other hours should be in the uh, cooking process, then for a 20 pot system, you would actually be able to have 2,100 kilograms of cooked rice and the entire system can be maintained by just one person. This is an actual photo of the shop floor and what it looks like, as you can see, uh, we have the containers that contain the rice as well as the steam boilers and steamers. I did explain the process of maintaining hygiene in the shop floor, but as you can see, the containers are actually transported through a conveyor. Therefore, uh, it's, human intervention is not needed and contamination will therefore not occur. The cooked rice can then be sold directly. You can sell it as white rice or you can further process it. For example, it can be sold as a semi-product. For example, uh, rice mixed with condiments or vegetables and meat, or you can actually uh, use it as a material for fried rice. So the cooked rice can be sold as a final product, which is cooked white rice, or sold as a semi-finished product to be used in stirred rice or fried rice. It's also possible for us to sell the white rice along with these condiments in a semi-finished stage so that the customer can actually finish it themselves. So, um, this is just the uses that I have shared with you. And that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Director Liu, for your sharing regarding the setup of a smart food factory. Next, we would like to invite manager Yi Zhang Tsai from CBC to share how the talent development strategy at CBC is carried out for uh, the smart manufacturing talents. Uh, this friends from Indonesia, distinguished guests, I am Yi Zhang Tsai. And what I'd like to share with you today is how we train personnel for a smart manufacturing era. This is, of course, a key concern and a top priority for us going forward. So I would like to share with you today how we approach the talent development strategies. This is a brief outline of my presentation. And I will basically be following this outline, outline to share with you our strategies. So first off, with decreasing birth rates and an aging population, the wage increases has actually been moving faster than the increase in labor population. Of course, uh, that's where technology comes in and how we use technology to make up for the labor gap. But other than that, our countries as well as the ROC government has also focused on improving the industry itself, moving towards smart manufacturing, a lean smart manufacturing for CPC we've continued to emphasize on the fundamental competitiveness that should come from enhanced productivity by following the industry 4.0 protocol, we promoted the productivity again strategy that allows us to assess and work with companies to develop smart manufacturing and industry 4.0. The government has also set up various training programs to assist the local businesses. This is a simplified flowchart of the current strategy regarding uh, smart manufacturing and precision manufacturing by using the 
this strategy, we'll be able to move from lean machinery to smart machinery, and finally to smart manufacturing. Uh, we also look forward to sharing our experience with our friends abroad. And since that is our major direction, we have various policies and programs in this direction that complement each other. Therefore, for the next part of my presentation, I would like to share with you how we approach the training program for talents that are meant for the small manufacturing era. So first, in establishing the smart automatic industrial personnel training service points, uh, we believe that this would serve as centers for us to integrate the training resources by having trainers, resources, and teaching materials at the same place. This would allow us to make better use of the resources that we have. Therefore, this building that I'm currently at, the Taichung Center of CPC, is actually where we have set up our training center. And you can see that we've consolidated all our training resources at this very center that would include uh, specific classrooms and areas for on-site operations. Regarding the equipment and facilities, uh, our vice president has really shared a little bit about the, our facilities, but here I'd like to um, show more about the types of classrooms and teach material that we have. If you look at the pictures starting from the left, we have the big data and AI training classrooms. And for these classrooms, we focus on teaching uh, AI programs, as well as how to use big data. The second type of classrooms would be smart sensor and IoT classrooms. For these classrooms, we provide various types of sensors that allow trainees to actually have hands-on experience working with sensors and they, how they are connected to the system. The third would be a smart manufacturing and IoT classroom. For these classrooms, we focus on the human machine interface, as well as control over uh, remote servers and uh, generally online control methods. The fourth type would be an automatic control and power distribution classroom. Uh, this classroom will focus on the basics in electronics and how switchboards work or how power distribution works. Finally, on the far right, we have the action platform um, position control classroom. This covers the IoT usage of two axis or three tri-axis machines. And this would allow the trainees to have hands experience on the servo control methods. So, uh, there will be various types of courses designed to make use of these classrooms. Uh, other than having our resources consolidated in a single place, we also have established a platform that focuses on smart manufacturing research and training. And this platform allows us to consolidate resources from overseas. For example, we work with Boehner, uh, Schneider, CADEX technology, etc. Uh, the companies that are listed here on this table. And these are companies that have in-depth experience in sport manufacturing. And we work with them to provide the training courses. This is an alliance and a resource pool that we can utilize to further broaden the types of courses that we provide. So by providing the actual hands experience and by working with the industry, uh, we hope to provide uh, useful and exciting courses. So let's now move to courses. 
uh, we basically use uh, this model as the basic model for setting up uh, courses. That is, we start from the production process at level zero and move up to sensors at level one, control level two, SCADA level three, MES at level four, and ERP at level five. And we follow these steps in designing our courses. Uh, trainees that apply for our courses would include, for example, uh, those that are in the process of looking for a job. And for these uh, trainees, we provide such an SAS course that would focus on first the basics and move up through the uh, pyramid from SCADA to MES and to ERP. This would also cover uh, monitoring and analysis and how to use the dashboards, etc. If we uh, break down this model, you would actually see the various topics that can be associated with each level. So if we look at the bottom level, as you can see, we will start out from the basics in electronics. For example, we start out with the switchboards. And once they have a basic understanding of how the electronics work, we'll move up to PLC to uh, integrated systems. And then we will introduce, for example, sensors, uh, SCADA control, mobile monitoring designs, and also talk about robotics, big data, as well as IoT and cloud applications. And all these courses would combine into a final presentation that we hope the trainees uh, will be able to use as a showcase of their skills and what they learned. So the courses are carried out interactively as well as in lectures. And uh, in groups like this, uh, usually the learning efficiency is at its highest. I have here actually listed the types of courses that we listed. The total, uh, we have over a hundred hours of uh, theory classes and over 200 hours of hands-on experience class. So you can see here for a total, this total is about 480 hours. The purpose of such a design is to allow those who do not have an IT background to also be able to work in this field after completing our courses. Here we have pictures of the uh, actual classroom activities and you can see that um, they all have chances to have hands experience as well as listen to the lecturers. Not only uh, theories, but also practices are very important. So we need to provide them with the opportunity to gain the hands on experience when it comes to uh, smart manufacturing. Here, we are only looking at uh, occupational pre training regarding uh, smart manufacturing. We also have uh, courses for uh, uh, industrial engineering talent. And it deals with uh, smart manufacturing being achieved through uh, integration of different production processes. We adopted, we adopt a step-by-step -step approach to facilitate the learning of the students through the process management and also the lean uh, process of uh, lean management of the process, we can uh, uh, introduce uh, the preliminary, preliminary uh, training material. And then we integrate uh, relevant uh, manufacturing uh, tech, uh, tech, uh, technologies or techniques. And this is uh, the, the class schedule for your reference, because this uh, deals with uh, the industrial uh, engineering for uh, uh, smart manufacturing. You can see uh, um, portions such as uh, TPM and other aspects, and also P application of PLC. The students uh, can uh, specifically uh, implement the techn techniques or technologies as a result of training. 
So if you have an IE background in the future, it may be you don't have the information, you can uh, participate in the training course so that you know you have a better idea about how to uh, implement uh, smart uh, manufacturing. So you can see the specialized sub subjects are uh, less 119 hours, technical subject 201 hour, and the total hours of 320 hours. So for this uh, portion is uh, an overall training courses for occupational for training. We started the courses in 2019. Currently, uh, four classes have been uh, conducted and about 300 to 400 hours have been achieved for each class. Uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, off offer the training to, e to even people who are between jobs so that it will be easier for them to find a suitable job in the future. And during the for the first, the third class, we have a, a internship program or internship element of the third class so that the trainees can also work with companies as interns so that in the future, they will be able to carry out what they learned in the training in, on the job in the future. We also offer uh, pay special attention to the importance of our training to uh, people on the job. For companies, uh, they may want to introduce uh, smart manufacturing, but they don't have enough talent. They may send their employees to join or to attend the training program. So this is more like on the job training. So we also have uh, this kind of uh, uh, class available for companies. And you can see different uh, elements such as uh, sensors, IoT, uh, CPS, uh, virtual integration, and big data. And a lot of people have signed up for the, uh, the programs. And for these people who have signed up for this for, for such program, uh, they have probably gain some uh, preliminary uh, experience based on their job. And you can see that the hours are shorter because they are more uh, theme-based. Probably only uh, uh, about 40, 54 hours in total for each uh, module. And also we need to arrange the training time so that uh, the training doesn't affect their job uh, under their employment. So in addition to uh, different training courses, we also organize uh, workshops and seminars. Uh, last year, we conducted uh, uh, a seminar on tapping the potentials of industry after the pandemic uh, is over. And the beginning of last year, we conducted an, uh, a a workshop on different uh, case studies involving the use of uh, cloud computing or big data. So, so if companies are interested in certain topics, they can um, sign up for the, uh, the seminars in order to understand the current direction of development within the country. So for these two uh, different workshops, a lot of companies send people to participate. Now, regarding smart um, uh, manufacturing in terms of education and strategies, we hope that not only the people who are currently being employed can understand the relevant subject matters, we also uh, uh, welcome um, trainees who are currently students in different colleges and universities. So we have an, uh, uh, occupational training routing plan. And we can invite uh, trainees who are currently uh, uh, college students or vocational school students through more interesting and encouraging uh, ways of in interactions. They can understand the future, the government's policy or industry policy, as well as the future development trend relating to them. As I mentioned, we have done a lot of work. And of course, we uh, would uh, 
show organize uh, events to showcase our achievements indicating how uh, the kind of activities that have been conducted in the past and also we have also indicated the number of uh, schools whose students have been um, have received our training so uh, on the, for the picture on the lower left, you can see uh, the uh, it depicts the creation of a presentation uh, material by uh, the the trainees, and the the picture on the lower right depicts uh, the structure of uh, the production line that they may be dealing with in the future. So uh, in addition to the different uh, uh, training locations, uh, we also will uh, prom further promote uh, the training by incorporating elements of smart manufacturing. For example, we have introduced an industrial talent investment program and because uh, for uh, the sake of uh, smart uh, manufacturing, we have policy related and non-policy related different modules for policy related modules. Well, the focus is on the current government policy regarding uh, smart manufacturing and also the government's uh, um, innovative industries plan. And this is an example about the, uh, the government's uh, smart manufacturing policies and we we have organized courses around the policies and uh, the uh, technical elements uh, in, include uh, SCADA, IoT and also smart sensing integration and of course uh, AI. These technical elements are incorporated in the uh, program but the the trainees are different. They are, they are uh, workers who are interested in this uh, subject matter on their own, and they want to engage in their uh, uh, self-improvement, or they want to develop their second uh, skill, and they may choose such courses. As a result, we'll be able to further expand the capacity of smart manufacturing by training people who are interested in smart manufacturing. So I have uh, shown you uh, the current uh, practices regarding the training of talent regarding uh, smart manufacturing in Taiwan. We need to uh, organize our uh, training courses uh, uh, and align them with the government's policy. And also our trainees include people between job and also people on the job and also people who are still at school. And also uh, people who are interested in smart manufacturing. So we have set up different physical locations where the training can be offered. And so in order to embrace the future, we also extend our reach to even uh, students who are currently um, at school. So I, I can, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tsai, for your presentation. Now uh, let's welcome Mr. Jianda from uh, Indonesia to share with us a smart manufacturing experience of uh, PT ben, Benangra Tetra Agam. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, just testing the microphone. Working. Okay. Um, can you hear my voice? Hello. Okay. Sure. Um, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Jonda from PT Bandangan Jertagum. Uh, we are located in South Borneo, Indonesia. And here's our brand. Uh, basically, it's called Prof. Uh, we produce this, we manufacture drinking water. So, first of all, a bit about us, our company profile. 
uh, we produce this drinking water uh, using the RO technology. So this reverse osmosis technology, which is, uh, there's a picture on the right side of our uh, reverse osmosis vessels. Uh, its capacity is about 50 tons per hour. We have two of them, so it's equals to about 100 tons per hour. And we produce uh, several variety of products, um, several varieties of package. First of all is a cup, uh, which is about 220 mil. And we have three varieties of bottles, uh, which is 330, 600, and 1,500 milliliters. And we also have a uh, 90 liters bottles, which we reverse uh, as gallons here in Indonesia. So uh, before I move on to the uh, pro as our progression to uh, industry 4.0, uh, a little bit of our company history. So we basically have been operating for about 30 years, uh, 30 years this year. So first factory, uh, uh, we operate in 1991, uh, still in South Borneo. And then we further uh, expand the factory uh, still in South Borneo, but in different location, which is in Bati Bati. So we have two main factories here. Uh, and then about 10 years after the second factory, uh, we progressed into a 4.0 industry, which uh, we invest on automated machineries. Uh, as to why we uh, invest on automated of the industrial uh, age, uh, we believe that um, automated machineries, um, sorry, okay, automated machineries uh would be more efficient and would be more, more productive and within our journey of entering the industry 4.0 we have won several yeah, well two uh distinguished awards which is first is a qms system so it's basically quality management system which is indonesia is the sni uh, it's an indonesian national standard award and second, uh, we have won the Paramakari Award for our productivity. So without further ado, I will show you some of our machines that we use uh, within the factory. So first of all is uh, our production line for the cup 200 to 220 milliliters. Uh, so left to right, uh, the pictures from left to right is the first one is a manual packing just to show the sample of uh, how we pack uh, the products manually, which we still do up till today. Um, and the second from the left is the robotics. So basically, we no longer need people to erect the carton. So it's automated already. And then uh, sec uh, third picture is the box sealer. So after it's packaged and after the uh, product is uh, placed onto the box, it will automatically seal it. And the last picture is uh, as a graphic animated animation of how the robots will place the product in place instead of people. So the output is we have two two uh, two machines. First is eight times two lines, which is about 420 box per hour, and then second one is 12 uh, by two lines, which produces about 600 a box per hour. So um, our standard, our production standard, as you can see from the second picture to the left, we use sandwich panel. Uh, and we also have the kind of, we also integrate it with the HEPA filter for, uh, in order to prevent any cross-contamination uh, within our the filling and within the production manufacturing of the product itself. And second is our second of our production line, the, Bottling line, uh, which is the 600 uh, for producing 1,500 milliliters. So again, a picture from the left is a manual labeling, and then comes to to manual packing. Uh, we have our new machines. We have the automated labelers and robotic robotic packing, uh, which the output of the bottling line is about or 600 mil. It's about 14,500 bottles per hour, uh, while the 1,500 mil is about 9,000 bottles uh, per hour. So it's a lot quicker, a lot faster. And here's for our, which is the 90 liters bottle. 
So uh, again, uh, left to right, the left most left is manual work. So basically everything is done manually except like, which is still filled uh, with the machines. But we do have uh, our new machines is quite automated. So second from the left again, is called Decafa. So usually uh, the 90 liters bottle is a returnable bottle. So whenever, so we have, we, uh, they can, consumers can refill the bottle. Uh, so when they return it back, usually they just put the cap back in place. And so instead of using uh, people, we use the, this robotic decap, use sensors to detect whether there's a cap or not, and it, it will automatically take it off. And then onto the next uh, is a machine called leak tester. Uh, it will test the cage, uh, so it will basically blow air inside it and it will detect whether the whether the air pressure are, uh, decreases over time. If it decreases, it will automatically take it out. So again, uh, it will increase in our efficiency and our output. And the last one is called pelletizing. Uh, so again, uh, the, the robot or let's just say the machines will automatically place it, place it on to the pallet. And then it will stack up, up to three levels with the output of about 1,000 bottles per hour. Uh, and for the technical support and, uh, and maintenance, so we bought a machine from machine makers, uh, from uh, mostly from Europe. So for example, this one is called the SMF machine. The brand is SMF. It's a machine. Uh, as you can see on the left side is the general and the right one is alarm and maintenance. So the, our machine maker could see uh, our settings and the, main, uh, and the alarms and maintenance schedule in Poland, in Germany. So they can just uh, remind us of uh, maintenance and they can remind us or perhaps help us uh, as well. We have uh, some technical. So it's basically a remote support from a machine maker. They can also uh, just set up the settings from Germany as well, because our machines is already connected to Wi-Fi. So in case we do not know how to operate it uh, well, we can just ask them instead to set up the machines for us. And while we are moving on to the, uh, our in industry 4.0, uh, we're still trying to retain and uh, again, which our culture uh, basically in South Borneo we have uh, this batik motif called batik so which we implement on our labeling as to show our identity and our well let's just say diversity and beauty of South Borneo and yes that's practically uh, my presentation so thank you Oh, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Joanda, for this in-depth presentation. I would now like to move into the Q&A session. But we've already collected a couple of questions beforehand. Uh, feel free to continue to ask questions through the chat room, if you have any. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I currently have a couple of questions here at hand. The first question is related to the LSM's inbound and outbound area management. We would like to learn more about the management of its inbound and outbound area. I think I have a VP Zhang too. Answer this question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, in terms of LSM uh, material in, or inbound materials and outbound material, let me explain it this way. First off, when we receive the raw materials, uh, 
if you have experienced uh, the factory, you will understand that we need to contact QC to check the quality of the raw material before they can be stored in the warehouse. But in the early days, what often happens is when the raw material is received, you have to communicate with QC and QC will then uh, carry out the inspections and then they would inform the factory that they've completed the inspection. But these, there could be a lot of time wasted spent waiting for one unit to complete its work. Therefore, if we have real time reporting, when the raw material enters the factory, the units will be immediately notified and they can carry out their work directly. The production line will also be able to submit requests for the type of raw material needed. This would be like the flight schedule of um, airline companies. Secondly, when it comes to inbound material, a dilemma is how we get the raw materials needed for a particular production line as quickly as possible from the warehouse. So there's actually a, a first in, first out policy that we need to follow. And this has to do with how we store the raw material. However, in terms of warehouse management, if this can be carried out automatically, for example, if uh, the warehouse can signal to the personnel or system which uh, shelf to go to first, then this actually saves time. This can be done easily by simply uh, having the lights light up for a certain shelf. Because if you've been to a warehouse, you know it could actually take a lot of time to locate the correct shelf. Thirdly, What's most important is a so-called working in process, WIP, and that is the, the amount of material needed and used in the production line. As mentioned, what we want is to speed up the process of retrieving the correct raw material. And secondly, is to make sure that the production line has enough raw material to complete the production. So this can be done through online sensors and on-site sensors. The system would also need the required information. For example, the system needs to know uh, how much raw material is left in order to know how many products it can create and also how long it will take for the raw materials to be uh, used in the production line. That is how long would the travel time be? Another issue is when we are filling the inventory, we need to have an idea of the orders received and expected orders. With the WIP information, working in progress information I just mentioned, we can have a tighter control of how the raw materials are transported and how much, how many, and the amount of raw materials that we still have. We would also be able to learn whether we need to refill a certain raw materials or so that the production does not uh, come to a brute halt. I think uh, this is just a very quick reply of the different types of management methods regarding inbound and outbound material. Thank you. The second question here is, when moving into Industry 4.0, what kind of challenges would the labor force encounter? All right, thank you for that question. Uh, when we're talking about Industry 4.0 and its relation with labors, we need to first understand what exactly is IOT. To put it simply, IOT involves information, automatic control, automation, communication, uh, this would include wireless and cable communication, and finally, the integration of these components. And it's not, it's easier said than done because it actually has to start from education. If we look at the education system, you have uh, double E, you have information science, 
and you have uh, different departments actually learning about uh, various fields. For example, control itself actually could can, this would involve the control between electronic parts and the control between the human and machine interface. So uh, if we break it down further, if we look at double E, for the top schools in Taiwan, the curriculum almost focuses entirely on semiconductors. They do not teach automation, PLC, or CAMP. So if we want talents in these fields, or actually people who have an understanding of all these fields, this is actually a problem for us. So in Industry 4.0, this is actually a hurdle that we need to overcome. We call this an SI, that is a system integration. We need people who are able to become system integrators and people who have cross-discipline training. But if we have people like this, the other issue, or the issue that will come up next would be uh, talent poaching from other companies. If you train someone, it's likely that another company would come and poach him or her away. So when it comes to labor issues, we need to first look at it from a training perspective and from a retention perspective. Uh, for, from my part, uh, what I can add is if we want to engage in industry 4.0 activities, we need people with cross-disciplinary background. And therefore, in terms of training courses, we need to make sure that not only do they provide the necessary knowledge, they also provide the trainees the ability to work among these various disciplines and people who are able to integrate the training from these disciplines together. That is actually as one of the key cornerstones of the uh, training program here at CPC and one area that we focus heavily upon. The fourth question. The third question, since 2019, how many students have completed, uh, well, after completing the training at uh, CPC Taizong, how many of them have been hired by companies to work on uh, assignments relating to Industry 4.0? And how has that affected the national training program in Taiwan? Let me ask Mr. Tai to address this question. Thank you, Dr. Wang. The question is about how many students have been hired by companies. I think the question is asking about the people on between jobs for these people. We have finished four classes. Uh, I think uh, one is still ongoing. So uh, after the, at the end of each class, uh, but each class achieve a 70% of employment rate. And we track that uh, uh, within three months after the, the end of the, the class. 
and about one third of them will participate will be involved in directly in uh, smart manufacturing. Now, another part of the question is about the, uh, the impact of our uh, uh, of our training since the beginning of the uh, the pandemic, we uh, pandemic, we changed the uh, the different arrangement of the class, and we are required to wear a mask uh, in the course of the training. And in fact, uh, before the pandemic, uh, the training uh, was conducted normally. However, in the past uh, uh, two weeks, uh, the pandemic in Taiwan has been uh, worsening. So. Uh, for uh, theory classes, theory-based training, we have in, uh, conducted remote training. However, for uh, uh, training involving hands-on operational machine, we postponed the training. So the pandemic has um, a, an impact, does have an impact on the, the, the progression of the training classes. Uh, let me uh, ask um, Mr. Zhang to uh, supplement on the current status of uh, people on the job who uh, received the training on the job. Uh, in, we have some train, trainees who do not have a science or technology background, but they switch their, uh, their direction after the training. And also for people on the job, last year we trained about 1,000 people. And this is also a cross-disciplinary learning. To give you an example, the trainees was uh, maybe uh, had a machinery background or IT background, but they do not understand control. And they may uh, participate in the training maybe after uh, work hours in order to improve themselves. So it's more like training for people on the job. Last year, we trained about 1,000 people. For this kind of a trainees, they have originally science and technology backgrounds. For example, they may be working on the IT, uh, but uh, the, as a result of the training, they can work on more diversified fields. And as, as far as the impact of the pandemic, there are two stages. Last year, originally, uh, they, in, in Thailand, uh, they would they would plan to send uh, a seat a trainer or to uh, participate in the training for about four months. Um, in Vietnam, in Vietnam, they plan to uh, send people to attend the training for six classes to train their uh, instructors. However, due to the pandemic, uh, the plans were aborted. So I'm talking about the, the situation about involving APO members, such as uh, uh, Thailand and Vietnam. Now, regarding Taiwan, In the second half of uh, May, after the 20th, because of uh, the escalation of uh, the infection in Taiwan, uh, all the training activities have been uh, halted. And we are going to resume after the, uh, uh, in the, uh, the, the situation uh, is so, sort of improved. Currently, it is required that uh, we cannot have more than five people in one room. So we need to uh, have two physical rooms in the for the webinar. Thank you, Vice uh, General Manager Zhang. Now we are going to answer the fourth question. The question is that it, it, the company has uh, PLC, Industry 4.0 equipment, pneumatic uh, devices, uh, Scanda, IoT, and robots. The question is, is it possible to gain any help so that the smart man, can we get help as to, the, as to the training materials that can be exchanged and how can we better linkage with uh, the industries? The questioner said that its company has a PLC, automated equipment, sensors, IoT, everything is in place, including robots. In order to answer this question, I think about what we can provide. I think uh, 
I think you have what it takes to be a smart factory already. So as long as you are willing to invest money, you can buy equipment. There's no problem. Companies in US, Europe, and Japan, and Taiwan can do that. It depends on how much money you have, how much money you want to spend. Then the, que the question I have is that, can you achieve smart manufacturing after the investment? No. Let me give an example. For F1 uh, Formula apparent right race, if you buy a supercar, is it true that you can join, can participate in the competition? No, you need to have the skill. You need to have people who can help re uh, retire, change the, re change the tires. If you are slow in changing the tires, you are going to lose. So you still need to have a team to do that. So this means that after you have purchased the equipment to set up a smart manufacturing, smart equipment factory, you still need to have a system. You need to have a proper system. What do I mean by that? I mean that for a company, your management should be able to go hand in hand with the operation of the factory for smart equipment. It's not possible to rely just on the people as the, well, the operator, how can you train the operator who can manage the equipment and also perform the QC? In addition to uh, manpower and the capability of manpower, more importantly, your business management capability is very important. Like I said, there are many aspects of management that should be changed accordingly. And also we, we need to have technical capabilities. According to statistics in Taiwan, regard, uh, for uh, robots that are sent for maintenance, uh, according to the experience in Taiwan, 70% of the, the situation involved the scenario where the robots are not damaged, but uh, actually they only involve the fact that the operators don't know how to use the robots. They are not actually broken. So uh, the maintenance capability and the technical capabilities are also very important. Now, regarding the structure of manpower, what can we offer? When it comes to management, we have QC operation or standardized management. And Mr. Tai has indicated very clearly, we have AI, smart manufacturing uh, control, uh, three axis um, platform. We have different modules and also system integration. And finally, the, the project uh, management capability and also the configuration of uh, the systems of companies. More importantly, fi finally, your corporate culture. Can you foster an environment where you can achieve TQC and TQM at the same time? You need to have an environment involving all the people. So I think these aspects are quite important. So thank you, Vice uh, General Manager Zhang, I, I think uh, we have uh, answered the four written questions. Do you have any questions which you'd like to raise on the spot? Uh, I'd like to thank our participants from Indonesia for participating in the webinar. If you still have any uh, question, you can do, send you a question through an MPO in, in, the, in Indonesia and send the email, uh, email the questions to us and we will address we'll, the, the questions uh, one by one. That concludes our uh, APO Smart Manufacturing uh, webinar. Thank you very much.
Recording stopped. Hello. Hello, for now. Senior, you Cuma mereka masih ada kan emosi ini.